Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. I do want to say before we begin that we are thankful for the opportunity and count it a privilege every time we are able to come here. It's been some time, I believe, since we've been able uh, to come and be with you, but we are certainly thankful uh, to be here in the service with you. Brother Trent asked me if I would to uh, bring a devotion, and uh, I've told people before and told him, I don't know what the difference is, really, in a devotion and a sermon. I guess a devotion is supposed to be a little shorter. Um, and I'm going to try not to take up too much of your time this afternoon. I know that you have this, a prayer service you would like to take part in. and uh, But there's a thought on my heart uh, that I would like to leave with you uh, this afternoon before our time together is over. We're going to begin reading in verse 35 of Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. And the Bible says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. And we'll stop reading there in verse 39. Now as we leave this text, I'd like to really focus uh, on one verse that we read, the first one we read there in verse 35. Uh, but I want us to think for a moment, and I want to give you two terms, if I could, uh, that, that we use commonly. And uh, one of them is the idea of corporate worship. Uh, corporate worship is when we would gather together here, we would pray, we would sing, we would have uh, the preaching of God's word. It would be uh, the gathering of the saints on the Lord's day uh, for all that that would entail. That's what we would speak of as corporate worship. Uh, we know that worship takes place outside of that corporate setting, outside of that gathering together. Uh, but that's an integral part of our, of our faith, uh, that, that meeting together. Also, there's this idea of what is called communal Christianity. You see that in Acts 2 in the early church. You see them gather together and they have all things common. They share homes, they share food, they share things with one another, they live with one another. And so they commune with one another constantly. And all of that is a great part of our faith, to be with one another, to have fellowship, communion, and that unity and bond with one another. But yet I want us to understand this and see this this afternoon. Uh, that our faith is not only uh, communal. Our faith is not only uh, in, a, in a public setting. Um, the sad reality is for many people, uh, the only type of spirituality they have, the only type uh, uh, really in which their spiritual life shows is in a public setting, is maybe that, you know, it's uh, every week you look forward to the day that we put our best clothes on, we gather together, we come to service, we sing and we pray and we have preaching, and we shake hands and we say, oh, how are you doing? And we leave. And that's kind of all some people's uh, spirituality is. All some people's uh, daily uh, Christianity is. Um, you, you know, there's a people, Paul speaks of, that have a form of godliness, yet deny the power thereof. They have an outward showing of godliness before other people, but yet there, there's nothing really there. Uh, and even Jesus speaks in Matthew 7 of the same kinds of people that profess his name and say, Lord, Lord, yet in the last, at the end, he tells them to depart from him, that he never knew them. And yet all they had was an outward showing. And that's good and well. But I want us to see this afternoon a reality that should be a part of every one uh, of our spiritual lives. And it is not uh, the public uh, aspect of it, uh, but it is a private aspect of it, the personal aspect of our spirituality, uh, which really... Uh, in the end, is all the more important. Because those in Matthew 7 put on a great show, and yet, uh, at the end, were not even of Christ to begin with. Because it was not personal, it was not private uh, with them. Now, we look at Jesus' pattern of life, and if you want any example in the Scriptures of what our spiritual life is to be, uh, Jesus is a supreme example of that. Hebrews makes that clear, doesn't he? He's better than everything. He's the greatest example of all things. And we see a pattern he lays out here of a private kind of spiritual life, and especially a private prayer life, which is important. It is. Um, 
you know, Jesus' ministry, he was approved of signs and wonders, Peter said, but yet uh, everything he did was, you know, not just to show off in a sense. It was not just uh, to be a public spectacle, but there was a private aspect of Jesus' ministry that, that I'd love to see this afternoon. And if you look at Jesus' pattern of prayer, there's more than we could ever cover in an afternoon uh, in the Gospels. Uh, but yet, uh, I want us to see this. And it focus especially on verse 35. So let's look at that verse for just a moment. And I want us to notice a few things uh, about uh, Jesus' prayer here. First this, uh, that to him it was supreme. It was supreme. Notice, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day. It was in the morning. It was early uh, is when he prayed. Now, I believe this notes two things. First, it's time, obviously, that he got up early in the morning, but it was a great while before day, before the sun had ever broke the sky, and yet he is here praying. David mentioned about prayer, that it was something that was to take place. Uh, he mentions in the morning in Psalm uh, 5, mentions at night in Psalm 141, mentions in another place, day and night. Uh, but, but, but it speaks of, he says that prayer was to take place any time that it was not confined to a location, it was not confined to a certain time of day or a certain part of the schedule in a week, uh, but it was to be continual, uh, to, as Paul said, pray without ceasing. Uh, to, it's to be a constant state of our being as those uh, that are saved. Uh, but he rises up uh, before anyone else. Why? And I believe it notes this other thing. It notes the importance uh, that it had in, in the place and in the uh, earthly ministry of Christ. It was important. David shares the same sentiment in Psalm 63 where he says that early would he seek the Lord. It would be early, not just a time of day, but of importance. It would be at the top of his list to seek uh, the Lord. And it would be the first priority. Now in great times of crisis and things like that, uh, many times it is that, you know, uh, Christ ends up, as sad as it is, not being the first priority. I saw a sign going down the road the other day that said, Have you tried everything? Well, try Jesus. And that's a good thought uh, to have, but the fact of the matter is really it's sad that it takes trying everything else uh, before we try the Lord. Uh, we, we try things in, in churches to, to bring people in and all these great events and activities and all of this, but at the end of the day, if the Lord is not sought before that, and they do no good, they're in vain, they're empty, and to no effect. And that's the idea here, that it, it was important. Before energy and time was wasted and effort wasted on anything else, it was given to the Father. It was given to God. Before anything of the day took his attention, he went to the Father. That was his first devotion. And you think of this, how often is it maybe you've woken up during the day, First thing in the morning, and you're, and you're immediately burdened about something. You're immediately bothered with something. Immediately, maybe someone uh, is on your heart, and you think about them. Maybe a lost person, maybe a family member in dire need, and you think about them. Well, I tell you, it'd be best to, at that very moment, first thing that day, uh, to turn it over to God in prayer, wouldn't it? Do a great deal of good, I believe. But we also see this, that he made time for seeking the Lord. He could have been resting, and he did many times in the Gospels, and yet he's up early before day uh, to seek the Father in prayer. There's a quote that I love. It says, Look no man in the face till thou hast seen the face of God. Speak thou with none till thou hast had speech with the Most High. Do not even start your day until you've had time uh, with God in prayer. That's the idea. And so first we see it's supreme. Uh, then we see this, that it's separated. It's separated. It was in the morning, he rose up a great while before day, and he went out. He went out. Went out alone. He went away. He's in Capernaum at the time. He goes away from the city. He leaves the house uh, that he was in, that of Simon, and he goes out to pray. And why not stay where he was? And maybe there's a few reasons for that. And I believe it... It was good that he separated himself. It'd do us good to separate ourselves at time, wouldn't it? You know, there's a lot of excitement going on around Jesus here. If you look back, um, in, in verse 33, he comes in and he, he uh, spells this devil from his, uh, 
people in his house. And it says all the city was gathered together at the door. He's surrounded, not just by his disciples or the people that were there in the house, but all the city comes. And so he goes away. Maybe he was just making an effort to kind of slow down. Um, you know, the pressure and busyness of life and his ministry. Maybe it was difficult at times just to get alone and to pray. I think about Martha. Uh, as, as Jesus would come into even her house, it, uh, the Son of God is here and she's cumbered about with much serving. She's busy with everything going on around her. And, but, but Mary is there hearing the words of the Lord, sitting at the feet of the Lord to hear his word, but Martha's just caught up in all the things going on around her. And aren't we the same so many times? That we're so enveloped and we're so consumed with all the things around us that we never take time just to be separated, to slow down and be apart from everything. And I believe this is the other reason. It was to remove distractions. Remove distractions. You know, it has been and always will be that for many people, when once they are bothered with something, when the Lord maybe would begin to convict them about something, that sometimes the first resort for people, the first thing they do is they begin to look for something as a distraction. If only they could get their mind off this thing. If only they could get away from what's bothering them. If only they could numb their mind with something so they wouldn't think about what it is the Lord has impressed them with. But here Jesus gets away and it's in a place where he can empty his mind of everything in life. He can look away from all that's going on around him and he can focus on God. We see in Matthew 13 those thorns that choke out the Word of God. That's what the cares of life are. That God plants this seed, but yet all the things around us choke it out. And so we see that it was something that was supreme and it was separated. And then we see this. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place. It was a solitary place. It's not that he just got away from some people and took others with him, but he got away all by himself. He goes uh, to a, a wilderness place. No one's around. And this is what I'd like to get to, especially this afternoon. This is where uh, the spiritual life is proven, isn't it? Not in the hustle and bustle of everyday life, not in the, the church around other people, though that's part of it, but it's proven in a solitary place. It's proven uh, when no one else is around to see or hear or know what is going on. The world can't see. And I tell you this, the greatest time you could ever have in your Christian life is to be in a solitary place. Because it's there that... Nothing can take your mind off of what is true and what is right. It's there that self-examination can happen. That we could say with David to ask the Lord to see if there be some wicked way in us to search me and try me, the reins in the heart, to see what's in me. There's nobody else around us. Isn't it so common that maybe we look at ourselves and see a problem with ourselves? And then we look at all the others around us and it, we pick apart their problems. We keep ourselves busy looking at everybody else's issues. But in a solitary place, there's no one else to critique. There's no one else to, to look at, but, but it's only us and God. It's here that the spiritual life is proven. Uh, Christ said not to be as the other hypocrites are that pray in the streets and the synagogues, that pray and make this spectacle before others. But he said that when you pray, go into your closet and there shut the door and then pray to God. Pray in that place. Uh, first and foremost, the man said once that the secret to prayer is secret prayer. It's to pray with no one else around. Much of the Christian life can really only be learned and experienced in this solitary place, in a place where it's just you and God and no one else. Same man said this, I care not whether you pray in the street or in the church or in the barrack room or in the cathedral. But your heart must speak with God in secret or you have not prayed. I believe that's the truth. God's people are forged in this place. They're made in this place. John the Baptist, he spends his entire life to be trained for, a, a, what, about a six-month ministry, if I've got that right, if you add it up. Six months, trained all his life away from other people, and then he comes out of that wilderness, and it's there that he's ready 
to serve God. Paul, the same way, 17 years if you add it up. Minimal contact with other people. And he comes out ready to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, one of the greatest confessions of David, Psalm 57, was made in a place in a cave, hiding out, running from Saul that was after his life. And it's in that place that he could say, that my heart is fixed, O oh God. My heart is fixed. That word fixed means prepared. Settled and prepared. For God, it was only in that place away from everything else that he could say that his heart was fixed. In a place that it was personal with him and with God. You know, isn't that the wonderful thing about our faith? Uh, that it is, it is personal. It is personal. It's a wonderful thing to think about the fact that, you know, God knows us, doesn't he? It's amazing to me. You think of the fact that an infinite and omnipotent and all-righteous God, that, that He knows me, knows the very hairs of my head, how they're numbered. He, he knows everything about us, David said. Our down-sitting and our uprising, our going back and forth, what we say and what we think and what we do, knows every bit of it, David said. You see, our faith is a personal faith. And so our Christian life is a personal life. You know, there's, there's no scenario in which Scripture speaks about that one day this kind of miraculous happening occurs and, and all people everywhere, regardless of what they've done or what they think or how they view God, that they're saved all together one, at one time. But no, it's in Scripture that people are saved individually. People are saved personally. And after that, our Christian life, though it comes with communion and with fellowship, it's a personal life. See, salvation is between you and God and no one else, and so your life after that, if it is to be what it is to be, it's going to be between you and God, first and foremost. Galatians 2, Paul says that the life he now lived, he lived it, but he lived by the faith of the Son of God who loved him and gave himself for him. It was him and Christ it was Him and God in His life. So we see that it was supreme, it was separate, uh, separated, it was solitary. But then I want us to see this, the very last thing, very quickly. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, He went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. There prayed. There are a lot of things that could be done in a solitary place. And yet, here, a prayer is put on a pedestal. The last thing I want to see is this. It was to seek. It was to seek. It was supreme. It was separated. It was solitary. And it was to seek after God. He spoke to the Father as He did many times. You can see Jesus, how He relied on prayer and communication with the Father all through His ministry. And God spoke back to Him. And I want to say this, that you go into that closet to pray and you expect God to yell something back to you. Uh, you may wait a while. But it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And we think of the fact that if we speak to God, how's He going to speak back? Well, I pray many of you this afternoon are holding God's spoken word, God's recorded word. That God has spoken, hasn't He? He's spoken times past in various ways by the prophets, and yet now today, He has spoken to us by His Son. He has spoken through His word. The man gave me advice once that said, if you want to hear from God, you take His word and you go alone by yourself and you pray. You pray for God to speak to you. And God didn't break the door down and tell me something right there, but by His word, and he showed me what it was that I was seeking. By his word, he revealed to me and opened the eyes of my understanding as it said that I might know uh, the answer to, to the issue of life at that time. But God speaks to us. I tell you, someone alone with God and his word is a powerful thing. It is. The man that... I love this account that... He's telling the story of, of a man that came to him and he was troubled. 
about salvation one day, and he said, well, I'll stay with you and I'll talk with you. And so they went along, pastor the man and scriptures, and they went and spoke for hours on end and hours. And it just didn't seem like he was getting it. And he just gave him the scriptures, and he gave him a few to read, and he said, I'll tell you what, you just read this. I'm going to step out, and you just be alone with God for a moment in his word. And it was there he told him to pray. Pray that God may open your eyes, and he did. And he came out of that room and he told the pastor, it was in, that he got it. He understood it. He understood the truth of Christ and the truth of himself. And he understood the facts of the gospel. And it was there that God helped him understand that he was lost, he was undone. And there was only one way to be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work at Calvary. And it was there that he uh, placed his faith in Christ. And it was him, God, and his word. See, it didn't take the pastor's eloquence and the pastor's Smooth talking. But it simply took him being alone with God. That's what I'd love for us to see this afternoon. That we may have a public, known spiritual life before the people. But I tell you, if we don't have a private and a personal spiritual life above that, then we truly have no spiritual life at all. We truly. And it pains me to know so many people that do have this form of godliness, this outward appearance, this thing that is known publicly, yet there's nothing personal. As a man said once, many people carry a cross around their neck but don't carry a crucified Savior in their heart. That's the truth. But I tell you this today, this afternoon, I don't know and haven't really spoken to many of you personally before in my life. I don't know what it is you deal with, what it is you face in life. I don't know any of that. But I tell you, whatever it is, you're here and you're lost and the Lord has convicted you and drawn you about the state you're in and the truth of Christ, I would counsel you in this to simply get along with God. Simply take it to God. If you're here and you are saved and it's something else you deal with, I would counsel you the same. To take time and be alone with God. You'll take time this week and be together with one another. But I tell you, don't neglect the private. Don't neglect the personal. Or the personal for that which is public, that which is known. I said once that great men of God have always been great men of prayer, men and women. That prayer was in private. You've heard before maybe of the people that would, by their bedsides, there would be almost grooves in the floor from where they stayed on their knees praying to God. It was there in that moment, not in public, but in private, alone with God, that they were forged and they were built into what they were by the grace of God. I pray this afternoon that we would take that time in our lives as Jesus did to first make it supreme, make it the first priority early in our life. And for you that are young, I pray it's this, you not waste the time you have now. That it be supreme, be separated and solitary, get away from the world and get alone with God and that it be to seek Him, that it be a much prayer, much anguish of heart. And I tell you this, there's never been a person go to the Lord in prayer and Him not be there. I pray we take that time that we could be alone with God this afternoon. Let's bow in prayer if we could. Heavenly Father, we bow to You this day. We thank You for the day, Lord, the blessing of it and the time together here. Thank you for this church. Lord, the people that make it up, Lord, a pastor you've placed here, we pray you continue to bless them. Uh, Lord, even their families, as they would labor for your sake in this place. Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, above all, that much be done for Christ's sake, uh, that first and foremost, that God would be glorified in everything that would be said and done. I pray, Lord, as we have opened your word here, that you would, by your Spirit, Uh, guide us and open our eyes that we could understand your word that we could take it and apply it to our lives in a way that would honor and glorify you as you seem fit 
Lord, we pray that our time here even is not wasted this day. Lord, help us always have our minds, attention, and our hearts, affection set on you, who you are and what you've done. Lord, help us. We would always be mindful of you. Lord, help us in our daily life that we would be willing to grow and even find a place of submission to you in that, Lord. Lord, above all this day, we pray for those which are lost. Lord, there's so many that we know and love, Lord, that even our hearts break for this day that don't know Christ. And we pray even if anyone here this evening, Lord, that if you have burdened them already, Lord, that you would continue to do so, that you would draw them to yourself and show them the truth of salvation. They might come to believe, trust, in what Christ has done for them and be saved. Lord, be with us through the service here and the remainder of the day. Bless in every way as only you can, Lord. We thank you and praise you for all things. We thank you most of all for Christ. Of course, in his name we pray. Amen.